we have looked at the laws of the Old Testament in the context of the Mosaic Covenant. Now, to make sense of the Old Testament, we must make sense of the laws. And to make sense of the laws is not enough to know what it is about in the context of the Old Testament. We need to look at what it has got to do with us under New Testament context. So to make sense of the laws, we need to see how it is applicable or is it not applicable to us as Christians. So we need to make sense of the laws in terms of the new covenant. We have seen how the laws fit in this framework in terms of the Mosaic Covenant. Now we want to see how it fit in the context of the new covenant. We have already looked at this passage which reveals the new covenant. And we will look at it again. Let's focus on verse 33. For this is the covenant, the new covenant, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We are experiencing the benefits of this covenant. And God said, I will put my law within them. So the law is still relevant. God has put the law in our hearts. Under the Mosaic Covenant, the Ten Commandments were written on tablets of stone and placed in the Ark of the Covenant in the temple. But instead of that, under the New Covenant, the laws will be written in our hearts, the hearts of believers. So the laws are still, in one way or another, relevant to us. The question is, are the laws binding on Christians? Or are they relevant, if not binding? If relevant, how can they be relevant? This chart summarizes the various views concerning the law and the Christian. That is, how the Mosaic Law relates to Jesus Christ. Now, on the top, there is five different titles there. The Judaizers, the Theonomists, the Mainstream Evangelicals, the Dispensationalists, and the Antinomians. This represents the different views. You see, there is no consensus, even until now, how the laws of the Old Testament relates to the Christians. There are two extremes, the Judaizers. They say the whole law is binding. The entire Mosaic law is binding, even on Christians. In the time of Paul, the Judaizers were basically Jewish people. But today, they are Judaizers who are Gentiles, who are arguing that we need to observe the Mosaic law. You may have heard of groups that promote the festivals, that as Christians, we need to observe the festivals. Then on the right-hand side, the other extreme are the antinomians. And they say the whole law is not relevant. None of it is relevant. Now, strictly speaking, I would not be talking about this and not even talk about the different views. If there is kind of a common consensus, and if there were no extremes, the extreme Judaizers, antinomians, these are heresies. Antinomians are still around. It has been promoted and, and has caused churches to split even today. It is also an ancient heresy, resurrected recently. Now, Next to the antinomians are the dispensationalists. Don't worry about the technical term. Basically, what they teach is this. No law binding unless repeated in the New Testament. In other words, the Old Testament laws are not binding unless the New Testament repeats them. Based on this criteria, they say only nine commandments are binding. That means the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment is not binding. They consider that as a ceremonial law, not a moral law. Then on the other side, next to the Judaizers are the Theonomists. They teach that all laws are binding unless repealed in the New Testament. 
So that means moral laws binding, civil laws are binding, but the ceremonial laws are not binding. Right in the middle are the mainstream evangelicals, and there are different views even within mainstream evangelicals. Basically, they teach that the moral law is binding, the Ten Commandments, all Ten Commandments are binding. And some will teach that the civil laws are relevant. And some will say that the civil laws are not relevant. And they all say the ceremonial laws are not relevant. So these are the major views that is out there. The middle three are not considered heresies, but the two extremes are heresies. At the bottom is the position I'm going to present in this course and uh, assume in this course in this position even the ceremonial laws are relevant we will look at what that means so before we do that let's quickly look at what do we mean by moral law civil or judicial laws and ceremonial law moral law Basically, God's view for humanity, for every human being. The Bible says, fear God and keep His commandments. This is binding on all human beings, not just believers. You shall be holy, because God is holy. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do to others what you want others to do to you. Do justice, love mercy. These are summaries of the moral law. And basically, the moral law is the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments expresses these basic moral law in concrete terms. And we have seen what the Ten Commandments consist of. They are so familiar. So this is the moral law. Next comes what is called the civil or judicial law. These are applications of the moral law in the nation of Israel. You see, the Ten Commandments of moral law is the constitution of the nation. But there are laws governing how the citizens, how the people ought to live. For example, part of the civil law that farmers are to leave the corners of the field unharvested for widows to glean. Now this is in the context of the ancient world. It's agricultural economy. Most people were farmers and they are to leave the corners unharvested so that widows can come and glean. This is to provide for the widows who do not have a means to support themselves. And civil laws also consist of penalties when they break it. For example, thieves should pay back four to five times what they have stolen. Under modern civil law, thieves are normally put to jail. But under the civil law of the Old Testament, the application of thou shalt not steal is that thieves are to pay back four and four to five times what they have stolen. And another law will be the Jubilee Year law. In the on the Jubilee Year, what the land that some you have bought, you have to return to the original owner. So these are civil law, the applications of the moral law. So in a sense, they are moral in nature, but they are not binding in the sense that the applications in the context of Israel. For example, most of us are not farmers, so leaving the corners and harvested doesn't make sense to us. So they are moral in nature. If they are relevant, they are directly relevant because the application of moral law, which is binding on all human beings. Thirdly, we have the ceremonial law. law. These are non-moral laws. These laws are not about right and wrong. The Ten Commandments is about right and wrong. And uh, the civil law is about right and wrong. Now, this is very crucial before we go further on the ceremonial laws. In the modern context, the civil law, the laws of a country, the laws that are passed in the parliament, may or may not be moral. For example, it is legal for non-Muslims to go to Gunting Highland and gamble. So it's legal, but it's not moral. 
So a law that is passed today may be legal, the civil law, but may not be moral. But in the context of the Old Testament, the civil laws, the legal laws, are all moral in nature. Should we split what is moral and what is legal? The ceremonial laws, on the other hand, are not about right and wrong. For example, the sacrificial laws. What to do when you have sinned? What sacrifice do you offer? And the non-moral Sabbath laws, such as the feasts and the festivals, these are not moral in nature. Now, I call, I say non-moral Sabbath laws because they are more, Sabbath laws are moral. For example, you shall work not more than six days. That is moral. And on the Jubilee year, you should return the land. That is moral in nature. But the feasts and festivals are not moral in nature. They are application of the Sabbath laws, or the Sabbath. Finally, the ritual purity laws, such as the food laws. We saw that holiness is not just moral purity, but also ritual purity. They need to be ritually pure. So to do that, they, there are certain food they cannot eat. Food, they are clean because God is holy. So the food laws, what is clean and unclean, will help them to recognize that they are to be holy. To be holy is not just morally pure, but also ritually pure. We saw how Nadab and Abihu could drop dead because they were ritually impure. They violated the ritual purity because they offer incense that is not prescribed. See, offering incense is not about right and wrong. It is a ritual to recognize God's holiness. So, having seen the differences between moral, judicial, civil law, and ceremonial law, now we can move forward to look at the chart. Because whether the Mosaic law is relevant or not relevant, binding or not, is usually classified in terms of moral law, civil law, and ceremonial law. I mentioned before, I personally do not classify them this way as we shall see very soon. Now we begin at the right hand extreme, the antinomians. Why do they teach that the whole law is not relevant anymore? This is the verse, Hebrews 8, 6 to 13. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises, for, for if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for the second. Of course, the first, the old covenant is the Mosaic covenant. The second is the new covenant. Verse 8 says, For he finds fault with them when he says, and what follows is the quotation of Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, which we saw just now, which about the revelation of the new covenant. God promised that He will make this new covenant with His people. Then verse 13. In speaking of a new covenant, He makes the first one, the Mosaic covenant, obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So, the Bible very clearly says the Mosaic covenant, the Mosaic law, is obsolete because the Mosaic Covenant has been replaced by the New Covenant. So, the Mosaic Law, which is central to the Mosaic, the Mosaic Law, which is central to the Mosaic Covenant, is obsolete. So, it's not obsolete. It's ready to vanish away. So, the Theonom antinomians say, therefore, the entire Mosaic Law is no longer relevant. It's obsolete. Well, that is one end of the spectrum. That is based on one verse. This verse says it is obsolete. Look at the other extreme, the Judaizers, who teach the whole law of binding. It's how is it possible that reading the same Bible, one group say whole law not relevant, another group say whole law is binding. Well, look at the verse upon which the Judaizers argue their case. Matthew 5, 17 to 19. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, 
until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of these of one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be great in the kingdom of heaven. So the Judaizers want to be great in the kingdom of heaven. So they teach that the whole law is binding because they say Jesus did not abolish the law. He came to fulfill them. He says not even a dot, not even a minutest detail of the law will pass away until all is accomplished. So based on this text, they argue the whole law is binding. Does the Bible contradict itself? Does Jesus here, Matthew, contradict what we read in Hebrews? Well, definitely not. So what do we do? We have two extremes. The horizontal error points that they need to meet somewhere in the middle. We will look at the verses that enable us to cause the two extremes to meet in the middle. So in the middle are the mainstream evangelicals. We will not talk about the theonomies and the dispensationalists. But in the process, we will address them. Mainstream evangelicals, that is what is represented there. Moral law, Ten Commandments is binding. Civil laws, relevant. Some say not relevant. Ceremonial laws, not relevant. Now, let's look at why we need to bring the two extremes to meet in the middle. Let's begin with the left-hand side with Mark, Colossians, and Hebrews. Mark 7, 18 says, And he, Jesus said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. Here, Mark interprets what Jesus said as he declared all foods clean. In other words, under the new covenant, all foods are clean. So, in other words, he considered the food laws no longer relevant in a sense because it's obsolete. So, therefore, the Judaizers cannot say that the whole law is still binding. They contradict Jesus. They quote Jesus' words. Here is also Jesus' words. So we must look at what Jesus said together and see how we make sense of it. Then Colossians 2.16, Paul says, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink. Basically saying, all foods are clean or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are shadows of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. In other words, the food laws, and the laws concerning festivals, and a new moon, and keeping this, the non-moral aspect of the Sabbath, all obsolete. In fact, in Galatians, Paul scolded them. They also did the same thing. They also observed days and years, the festivals, and Paul said, I'm afraid I have wasted my time on you. It's so serious. So therefore, the, those groups that still promote observing the festivals, they, they don't really read the Bible carefully. They just take what Jesus said there out of the total context of the New Testament, let alone the Old Testament, and make it into something compulsory something still binding on all Christians. And in Hebrews 10, 17, and he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. That means they are forgiven. For where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering of sin. The idea is their sacrificial laws are no longer valid. They are obsolete. After Christ died on the cross, offering the sacrifices will not result in forgiveness of sin. 
is no longer usable. I mentioned that even in the Old Testament, when they offered the sacrifices, when it was valid, it was Christ's death in the future that paid for their sin. They were using credit cards. So after Christ's death on the cross, credit cards are no longer accepted. After Christ's death on the cross, we don't use credit card. Neither do we pay cash. Only one person pay cash. One of the thieves who died with Christ on the cross, he received forgiveness for his sins when Christ was dying for the sin. So after that, we actually use what we call gift vouchers. It's paid for. We just by faith bring the voucher to God and receive the forgiveness of sin. So you see, just three these verses, there are more verses we can quote, shows we need to point towards the middle. How about the other end? From the right hand side, coming from the direction of the antinomians, Hebrews 8, towards the middle. Ezekiel 36, 37, this is another version of the new covenant. God said, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my laws. You see, God said, I will put my spirit within you. This is what happens when a person becomes a Christian. God's spirit dwells in him. And what, what's the purpose of that? Cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. That means the laws somehow need to be obeyed. The Spirit was given so that His people could observe God's laws. So He has to move towards the middle. Exodus 28. This is the Sabbath commandment. I highlight the purpose of the Sabbath commandment. Remember the Sabbath day. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the, seventh, the Sabbath day and made it holy. This is the reason why Israel needed to observe the Sabbath law, the Sabbath day, which later expanded to the Sabbath year and the Jubilee year. This is based on God's creation of the world because God set that model rest on the seventh day. So the Sabbath law was based on what God did at creation. Then Deuteronomy 5, which repeats the Ten Commandments, and in terms of the Sabbath law, it gives a different reason why they need to keep the Sabbath law. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So a, a different reason is given, that they were redeemed from Egypt, therefore they need to observe the Sabbath day. Now. Interesting, the two versions of the Ten Commandments are basically the same. The main difference is this, the reason for the Sabbath commandment. The Deuteronomy version is basically meant for Israel because they were taken out of Egypt. But the Exodus 20 version is based on creation. So the difference alert us to recognize that the Sabbath commandment is actually meant for all humanity. But in the case of Israel, they have another reason to observe the Sabbath law because God took them out of Egypt, set them free, so they have to practice the Sabbath, day, Sabbath law in order to love the neighbors themselves, to treat their fellow members fairly. Now this is crucial because as we saw in the chart, there are people, mainly dispensationalists and others who are not, who say the Sabbath commandments are not relevant to the Christian, not binding on the Christian. But when you compare Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, it shows, it alerts us. There are one reason that is universal based on God's creation. Anyone created by God is bound by this law because God made the Sabbath day holy. This is long before Israel became a nation. Even before Abraham was born, God already sanctified the Sabbath day and made it holy. So it's binding on all human beings. 
Now, the question arises, how is it that the Mosaic Covenant is obsolete, yet the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath Commandment, is still binding on Christians? Now, this comparison will help us answer the question. Now, in Singapore, there is a law against renting your apartment to illegal migrants, illegal migrants. And you can go to jail for doing that. Just say you own an apartment in Singapore and uh, you are renting out to a legal migrant. He shows the papers he is legal. And you are afraid that he may sublet it to illegal ones. Rent a room to illegal ones. So, and you can get into trouble for that. So he, in his contract with you, he specified that you are not to sublet any room to illegal migrants to protect yourself. Now, after that contract is over, you, that's the contract was for three years. After three years, your tenant decided not to renew and he has moved out. Now, that contract that you signed with him is obsolete, no longer valid. The whole contract is obsolete, but inside that contract, there is this statement, you shall not sublet any room to illegal migrant. Is that requirement obsolete? No, because it is based on the law of the country. Your contract put that law into your contract. So that when your contract is obsolete, the law is not obsolete unless the country repealed the law. In the same way, the Ten Commandments is God's will, God's moral law for all humanity. All humanity will be judged on the basis of that. And in making the Mosaic Covenant, because Israel is a human community and they are supposed to be a model nation for all humanity. So the Ten Commandments is incorporated in the Mosaic Covenant. So when the Mosaic Covenant is obsolete, like your contract with your tenant is obsolete, doesn't mean the law that it incorporates is obsolete. So therefore, even though the Mosaic law is obsolete, the Ten Commandments is not. Then look at Leviticus 9.13. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until morning. Now you see, it's a very clear application of you shall not steal, you shall not oppress or rob him. And an application into civil law is the wages of a hired worker should not remain with you. In other words, in those days they are paid by the day. So you hire a worker, at the end of the day you should pay him, you should not keep until next morning. If you do that, you are robbing him, you are oppressing your neighbor. So, the civil law is so clearly based on the moral law. So, how do you separate civil and moral? So, therefore, I do not separate them. So, you can see that the civil law is in some way relevant. In fact, this can be applied directly. If you hire a worker on a daily basis, you pay him. Don't wait till next morning. Now, we move on from what is out there, the different views out there. I will present this position, second half. The only difference with the mainstream evangelicals is that I argue that the moral law is binding. The civil laws are directly relevant, directly relevant because they are applications of the moral law, binding law. The ceremonial laws are indirectly relevant. You'll see what I mean by indirectly relevant. So, pay, have this in mind. Moral law is binding. The civil laws is directly relevant. Ceremonial laws indirectly relevant. The reason is this. Now, look at one extreme. The law is fulfilled but not abolished. Fulfill but not abolish. On the other extreme, the law is obsolete. That means, if you look at the highlighted, underlying statements there, 
the moral law, meaning Ten Commandments by the laws, fulfilled by Jesus, therefore become obsolete, but not abolished. Therefore, the purpose is still valid. This is key to understanding what I'm saying here. It is fulfilled, therefore it becomes obsolete. But it is not abolished. Not abolished means the purpose is still valid. Before we look, take a closer look at that, let's look at the purpose of the Mosaic Law and the New Covenant. This is Leviticus 19. You shall be holy for the Lord your God am holy. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You shall be holy. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is binding on the Israelites under the Mosaic Covenant. Deuteronomy said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. That is binding on the Israelites under the Mosaic Covenant. But Peter, speaking in the context of the New Covenant, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. The church, the Christian, must also be holy because God is holy. God has not changed. So therefore, the purpose of the Mosaic Covenant, or of the purpose of the Mosaic Law, is still the same as in the New Testament. You shall be holy, for I am holy. Then Matthew 22, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is a great and first commandment. And the second is like this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. That means all the law and the prophets, the prophets implement the law. We shall look at the prophets later on. They are still relevant. In other words, the law still relevant, the prophets preaching still relevant. We will see how. Because the purpose of the Mosaic Covenant is the same as the purpose of the New Covenant that his God's people will be holy. They will love God. They will love their neighbor as themselves. Now we look at how this works out in the specific laws. We will begin with the sacrifices, the sacrificial law, which is ceremonial in nature. And uh, the sacrifices were needed when they violate holiness. They fail to be holy. They fail to observe the Ten Commandments. They fail to observe both moral as well as ritual purity. That is what happened in the Old Testament. And we see how it is indirectly relevant. The sacrifices are indirectly relevant to Christians today. Let's look at John 1.29. The next day, he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming to him, towards him, and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This Lamb of God will take away the sin of the world. This is the final Lamb, the final sacrifice that paid for the sin of the world, even the sin in the past. We looked at that before. Paid the credit card bills because God forgave sins in the past. And we have looked at these two verses before. Romans 3.25, whom God put forward as a proposition by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. And Hebrew 9, therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Now, why do I say that the sacrifices, though obsolete, are still relevant, indirectly relevant. The reason is, they are fulfilled by Jesus, therefore rendering the sacrifices obsolete. No more forgiveness through sacrifices. Credit cards no longer accepted. But the law is not abolished. What does it mean? That the sacrifices are obsolete, fulfilled, but not abolished. What does it mean when you say the sacrificial laws are abolished? When you abolish a law, you mean you repeal it in such a way that the reason for the law no longer valid. For example, there's a law for the certain traffic law concerning a certain kind of vehicles. Later on, that kind of vehicle doesn't exist anymore. So the law is no longer valid, obsolete. Why? 
because the purpose why it was enacted in the first place no longer there. Now, if we say that sacrificial laws are abolished, that means the purpose for the law is no longer valid. What is the purpose of the law? For the forgiveness of sin. Is the need for the forgiveness of sin still valid? Is the purpose still there? Yes. The sacrificial law shows that we are sinful. Therefore, we need this. in the Old Testament the sacrifices, in the Old Testament the sacrifice of Christ. Therefore, non-believers still need to accept Christ, the sacrifice to be forgiven of sin. This is still valid. The purpose is still valid because there is still a need for forgiveness of sin. And we still need Christ to be our mediator in heaven, to be our mediator. Even though we are forgiven, Christ is there so that when we sin, we can continue to claim the forgiveness of Christ. So, in that sense, the purpose of the sacrificial laws are still valid. So, the laws are not abolished, fulfilled. So, that's why I say it is indirectly relevant. Now, we we'll move on to look at the Sabbath laws. The Sabbath law consists of moral, civil, and ceremonial aspects. As it is expressed in the Ten Commandments, you shall not work more than six days. It is moral, binding on all human beings. When it becomes applied in terms of the Jubilee law, if you buy a piece of land from your neighbor on the Jubilee day, you return. That is civil, but it's the application of the moral law and the ceremonial aspect, the feasts and the festivals. So, therefore, the Sabbath laws to the Christian can be binding depending on which aspect, can be directly or indirectly relevant. Look at some verses. Jesus speaking to the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father, but the hour is coming and is here now here when the true worshipper will worship the father in spirit and truth for the father is seeking such people to worship him in other words jesus is saying well worship is still binding but no longer specifically in jerusalem as under the mosaic covenant you can worship god anywhere because god is spirit he is everywhere which is what we are doing today under the new covenant so, this aspect of the Sabbath commandment, the moral aspect, is binding. X4. The early church, many of the Jews were poor because they were driven out of their homes when they became Christians. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Now, this is a kind of application of the Jubilee law or even the, 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 the Sabbath year law because on the Sabbath year, those poor people who sold themselves as slaves to be set free. And Jubilee year, those who have sold land, you have to return to the land, is to take care of the poor in terms of money, in terms of land. And here, they sold the land and so that everybody's need were met. So this is actually an application of the moral aspect of the Sabbath law, the Sabbath commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself, as expressed through uh, the Sabbath laws in terms of the Sabbath year and the Jubilee year. So this is the civil aspect. So you see, it is directly relevant. The question is, how do we put into practice? Then 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six about the Lord's Supper. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the, the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now we all know that the past the, 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 the Lord's Supper was actually a continuation of the Passover in New Testament terms under the New Covenant. Jesus actually instituted the Lord's Supper when he was observing the Passover meal. 
Remember? So that is the ceremonial aspect of the Sabbath commandment. And it becomes this ritual, this non-moral aspect to observe the Lord's Supper. Baptism, same thing. So you see, the different aspects of the law, whether the moral, civil, or ceremonial, somehow can be applied under the new covenant. So this is the Sabbath laws. So we only look at a few examples. So if, 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 based on this principle, if we spread out the other examples, we can see how all the laws of Old Testament somehow relevant to us whether binding directly or indirectly relevant. So in this way, we make sense of the laws of the Old Testament. How, when we read the laws, it speaks to us and see how we can put it into practice in our context in Christ. Now we move on to look at it from a different angle. We have looked at it in terms of the sacrificial laws and the Sabbath laws. Now we look at it in terms of moral purity. Now, I have mentioned I do not divide into moral civil ceremonial because you see, under the Sabbath laws, they are all mixed together. Instead, I will split the laws in terms of laws that concern moral purity. Moral purity means moral laws and civil laws because they are moral in nature. And we see how the New Testament talks about them. Romans 8.3 by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. That means being filled with the spirit and walk accordingly. Then we will fulfill the righteous requirement of the law. The law. And the law refers to the Old Testament law. What the law requires will be fulfilled when we walk according to the Spirit, because Christ has made all this possible. And what is the requirement of the law? Two ch few chapters down, Paul says, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is the requirement of the law. When we walk by the Spirit, love our neighbor as ourselves, we will fulfill the law because the law can be summed up as you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is assuming that we love God. The impetus to love our neighbor as ourselves is to love God. And Galatians 5.13 For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in this one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, the civil aspect of the Mosaic law is basically to serve one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. Serve one another. If you read carefully, it's basically serving one another. And here Paul said, in Christ, we are true love to serve one another. So this is where we put into practice the equivalent of the civil law under the Mosaic covenant. So, the law is relevant, binding, the civil law. Now we look at the ritual purity, the ceremonial law. All the ceremonial law comes under ritual purity because they are not moral in nature. They are obsolete and they are non-moral. How are they relevant to Christians under the New Covenant? They are indirectly relevant. Look at these few verses. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Do you not know that you are God's temple and God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroy God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy. You are his temple. In other words, not only the law is now written on the hearts of his people are not on tablets of stone. God's, God's dwelling is no longer in and through the tabernacle or the temple. That is obsolete. But the believers, the body of Christ has become God's temple. God dwells within the body of Christ. In case we think that God only dwells 
in the body of Christ, in terms of God's people in general. Paul specified in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Note, the body is singular. You is plural. The body of each of you, each of our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's not to say that if there are 10 Christians, there are 10 temples, because there is only one body of Christ, one temple. But this is to specify that the body of each of God's body, Christ's body, is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So therefore, each of us glorify God in your body. Now, God's glory was manifested in and through the temple. So therefore, when we are God's temple, God's glory must be manifested. So we have to glorify God in our body. How? Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Note carefully, all these are spoken in the context of the church, the body of Christ, as the temple of the Holy Spirit, to glorify God. The, 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 the ritual laws in the Old Testament are in the context of the temple, the tabernacle, because God dwells in their midst. They need to be morally and ritually pure. In the same way, because God dwells in our body, we need to be morally and ritually pure. And we sin. When we sin, we need to confess our sin and receive forgiveness just like they did in the Old Testament days. So, this is how we fulfill ritual purity. Eating and drinking. Eating and drinking is not moral. It's not about right and wrong. God made us in such a way that we need to eat and drink. But Paul said, whatever you do, whether eat or drink, moral or non-moral, do it to the glory of God. So we must not think it's only what is right and wrong that matters. There are things that are not about right and wrong. But do we glorify God? And Paul gives some uh, guidance in 1 Corinthians. For example, all things are lawful. It's not right and wrong. But not all things edify. And he say, all things are lawful. But I may even be enslaved to it. So these are guidance concerning things that are not about right and wrong. Does it glorify God? Because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is where ritual purity becomes relevant, indirectly relevant. So even Christians, because we are to be holy, and holiness is not just moral purity, but ritual purity. Therefore, even in areas of our life that are not moral in nature, including eating and drinking, we need to glorify God. In the context of Corinthians, it's about food offered to idols. Because some believers, their conscience are weak, they, they, they think, they think food, food offered to idols are sinful if they eat. And when the stronger Christian eat that, and, and then the younger Christian follows suit and become guilty, then, then they become stumble. So Paul said, I will not eat if I cause my brother to stumble. That does not glorify God, even though it's not about right and wrong. Because I need to do all things in the glory of God. Because I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit, I need to observe both moral and ritual purity. Then finally, we sum up the main difference between the Mosaic Law, the Mosaic Covenant, in terms of the Law, and the New Covenant. The Mosaic Law, under the Mosaic Law, under the Mosaic Covenant, Israel is a law-centered and regulated community. But the laws are not legalistic. Look at this. We already look at this. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was also by grace. And uh, why was the law given? Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming of faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we no longer we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. What it means is this. The law was given as a guardian to supervise, to regulate 
God's people. Now, they became God's people by grace. So the law was not meant to, for them to receive forgiveness. The law was to guide them to be holy, ritual, and moral. And when they fail, within the law, the sacrificial system is to bring forgiveness. You see, it's by grace. It's not legalistic. They are, they are, they are not observed the law in order to obtain forgiveness, in order to be saved. That is legalistic. This is where the Old Testament law differ from Islam. Islam is also law-centered, law-regulated. Both Israel and Islam, their community, their life revolve around the law. The law supervise and regulate them. But the difference between Islam and the Old Testament law is, Islam is legalistic. They observe the law in order to find salvation. In the Old Testament, the observation of the law is not to find salvation. It is to be holy because God is holy. They became God's people by grace. They were saved by grace through the forgiveness of sin. So this law-centered, law-supervised, but not legalistic. Whereas in Christ, because no longer guardian, we are no longer to be law-centered, law-regulated, but Christ-centered, spirit-led, and word-saturated. We have seen how the law is relevant or not relevant. But the law is still not like in the Old Testament. Christian life does not revolve around the law. It's not law-centered. The Christian life revolves around Christ, Christ-centered, empowered, led by the Spirit, and saturated with the Word. Let's look at these two verses. And do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Therefore, walk by the Spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. You see, in the name of Christ, fear of Christ, in the Old Testament is fear of the Lord, fear of God, now fear of Christ. It becomes Christ-centered and be filled with the Spirit. Spirit-led. Then Colossians 3. A slightly different version of the same thing. Colossians and Ephesians were written about the same time when Paul was under house arrest in Rome. And Felix, uh, the Ephesian church and Colossian church were nearby. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart to which indeed you were called in one body. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. See how Christ said that it is? Let the peace of Christ rule. Let the word of Christ dwell richly. Now, the efficient version, let the Spirit fill you. Here, let the word about Christ dwell in you, fill you. And the outcome is the same. Singing hymns and psalms and so on. Giving thanks in the name of Christ. So, being Christ-centered will take care of the commandments because when we walk by the Spirit, we will fulfill the requirement of the law. So, when we are filled by the Spirit, we will be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Fear Christ and keep His commandments. And Jesus said, you love me, you keep my commandments. So, when we focus on Christ, empower the Spirit, and saturated by the Word of God, the commandments of God will take care of itself. And the fruit of the Spirit, there is no law against it. So therefore, we can see how the entire Mosaic law makes sense to us as Christians. So we read the Old Testament, not just the Pentateuch, the laws, even the history books, because the history book is about how Israel failed to keep the law or not keep the law. The prophets is about whether they keep the law or not. We can see relevance. We can begin to make sense. But of course, we will go through these books individually to see how it makes sense to us as Christians.